Hey everyone, I'm Mike Sattel, your favorite SAT tutor, and in this lesson, I'm gonna go through the top 10 SAT traps to avoid on your exam. This is a great lesson to watch, maybe the night before your SAT, the morning of your SAT. It basically just serves as a reminder of the psychological aspect of this test, something that's easy to forget. And maybe another great title for this lesson would be the top 10 traps that drive me absolutely insane. I work with a lot of students and some of them never really catch on to this. No matter how many times they fall into these traps, they continue to make these mistakes. And it's because they never really understand the psychological aspect of the SAT. They treat it just like a knowledge test where if you memorize all the formulas and rules and vocab words, that's it, you're gonna get a 1600. But obviously it does not work like that. You need to be aware of your instincts. You need to be aware of how the SAT is gonna take advantage of your instincts and overconfidence costs people in these cases sometimes 30 40 50 points per test so my hope is that with these questions I can show you how the SAT is trying to manipulate you and maybe save you a few of those points on the test so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through 10 questions that show off these common trap answers. They're relatively easy questions, so there's nothing really exciting here, and I'm not really gonna be teaching these specific topics that are on these things. I'm gonna just be going through quickly, focusing on the traps. But these are not gonna spoil any of the practice tests. These are all questions that I wrote, as always, so you can watch this video without worrying about spoiling anything on the practice materials, but hopefully I do spoil a couple of the real questions by helping you avoid these traps. So I'm gonna put the question up for 10 seconds. Feel free to pause the video and try it yourself. Then we'll get right into the explanation and we're gonna count down to the number one trap that drives me absolutely insane. But let's start with number 10, the 10th most annoying trap that you need to make sure you avoid on your SAT. This is not hard. Let's just do this algebra, right? So let's distribute. We get 2x plus 6 is equal to 4x minus 6. Subtract 2x, subtract 2x. Let's add the 6 while we're at it. We get 12 is equal to 2x. Divide by 2, divide by 2. We get 6 is equal to x. And that is our trap. Why is that a trap? Well, they didn't want X. They wanted 3X, which is nice and easy to get to. You just multiply by three, we get 18 and we're done. But I call this a mission accomplished trap because we have these moments in math where we get an answer, we get X equals a number and we think, ah, mission accomplished. That's the end of math. No more math necessary. The SAT definitely takes advantage of that. You will almost certainly see a question like this on your test. So make sure you always go back to the question before you select your answer to make sure that you're giving them what they want, not what just you feel like is the end of the math problem. There aren't very many of these nearly means vocab questions on the SAT, but it's important to remember that when it's in the hard module, when we know that we've got a hard question, the answer is never really going to be the main definition of the word that you're familiar with. So even just looking at this word carriage, I know what a carriage is. It's like a wagon. It's like a thing that has, you know, horses drawing it, or it's a form of transportation. So it's very unlikely that both of those or either of those is going to be the right answer. This is a hard passage. It's difficult to understand. So if you had no clue what's going on, at least avoid those trap answers. There are a little too good to be true. Instead, we can then just look at the passage and see what kinds of clues we have. They're talking about what he looks like, his countenance, which is kind of the way that you, you seem to other people. So that would be like your demeanor or your bearing. So that is definitely the answer. Now, if it is an easier one of these questions, it is totally possible that the correct answer will be a very common definition of the word. So if you've got a lot of evidence that the common definition is correct, then just pick it. But if it's a hard question, you have no idea what's going on, at the very least, you should avoid the more common definitions of these words because they're probably traps and it's probably an uncommon definition that works with that passage. This is a more rare kind of trap. It's a good reminder that if you answer a question without using all the information on the SAT, that's not really a good sign, especially in the math section. So what some people do here is they read this question, they recognize that there's 24 books per shelf and 38 books per shelf. So they just add those up, right? That's gonna be 24 plus 38 over two. They're doing a simple average of just those two numbers. So they get 31. So that is our trap answer. 
it's not going to be that. Look, you left behind some pieces of information, right? There's 80 shelves in one case, 60 shelves in the other. That's not how averages work. You're treating it like these are two even sets. They're not even. But it's okay. We have a system we can use to make sure that we get it. We're still going to use averages. We're just going to do it with a little bit more uh, work. So we would have to do that 80 is the average, or rather the average is the, uh, 24 is the average when we have 80 books. So we're going to find the sum of that. We multiply and we get that the sum is 1920. Then we're going to do it again for the other books. So there's uh, 38 books is the average for 60 shelves. So we're going to get the sum there. We're going to multiply 38 by 60 to get that it is 2280. Now let's add those two numbers together. That's 4200. And we divide that by the 140 total books. And that gives us an average of 30. So it's a little bit more work, but it still uses the same basic average formula. So two things here, just make sure that if you have averages, you are taking into account the different amounts of numbers in the sets, the different weights of those averages. Plus, on any SAT question, not just averages, if they give you information in the problem and you don't use it to solve that problem, that's a pretty good sign that you are falling into a trap. The SAT loves to mess with you with dimensions. So moving from two dimensions to three dimensions or one dimension to three dimensions or two dimensions. So you got to be careful with how that works in the formula. So it's always best to have some sort of way to visualize what's going on. What a lot of people do here is they walk right into the trap. They see that the conversion is one foot is 12 inches. We have 192 square feet. So they multiply that by 12 and they get 2304, which is definitely the trap. Even on the easy module, you should be nervous about something like this. Are they really going to just ask you to multiply two numbers and get a basic kind of like conversion like that? Probably not. Maybe if at the beginning of the section, but really anywhere past like question number seven, that's going to be way too easy and you should be suspicious of that kind of thing. Now, the problem here is that feet and inches are not the same as square feet and square inches. So the best way to do this, in my opinion, is to come up with a very, very simple picture. Let's draw a very, very long room where we have one foot on one side and 192 feet on the other. Now that room is going to have an area of 192 square feet and we can convert each dimension, each side of that room, two inches. So one foot is 12 inches on this side and 192, well, that is 2,304 inches. But now when we find the amount of square inches, we're going to multiply these two numbers and we're going to get 27,648. And that is the answer. Another way to have gotten this is to think that instead of having uh, feet and inches, we could have that one square foot is equal to 144 square inches because just think about it if it's one foot on each side it's 12 inches on each side so we have to convert the conversion in order to do this question but you should sense that coming you should sense that just multiplying two numbers like that is way too easy there's got to be something else you can do so drawing something out can actually help you see the trap coming and avoid it All right, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this entire passage for you. I just want to point out things that are, should be obvious traps that a lot of people just don't train themselves to notice. So when we're going through answer choices and trying to compare it to the passage, we're always looking for strong words. What stands out as having a lot of weight in this choice and then what we, what we can go find in the passage to prove that choice. So in choice A, it highlights that researchers advise new methods of measuring chemical concentrations in fish. Well, they do talk about measuring the concentrations, but they never say these are new methods, right? That's a very strong word, but that's a strong word in a very traditional sense. So I do not think of this as a trap answer. What happens on this question is people then get very confused between the remaining answers. They all seem right in various ways. But to me, there are some very obvious traps. Increasing rate, that is a quantifier trap. Whenever we start talking about numbers in answer choices, we gotta be very nervous. Does the passage support those numbers? The same thing happens in choice D where we have the scientists blame most of the ocean pollution. This is another clear trap. These are words that I would sense right away as soon as I'm reading the answer choice. Even if I had never read the passage, those would be answer choices that I'd be very suspicious of. Now, it doesn't mean that they are guaranteed to be wrong. It just means that we need to go checking for these ideas in the passage. And in this case, we will not find them. They do not say that pollution is entering at an increasing rate. That is just our knowledge from current events that we are going for there. And it does not say that the scientists blame most of anything on the agricultural runoff. They might blame some of the pollution on that, but not blame it. blaming most of the pollution on that is a different story altogether. And that's why those strong words make a big difference and help us eliminate choices. So the correct answer here is C. If you have questions about that, feel free to put it in the comments. But what I really want to stress is that there are certain words that you should have trained yourself to notice in answer choices. 
choices. They are not necessarily guarantees that answer choices are wrong, but especially on very hard passages, you want to be able to spot those words really easily so you can evaluate that choice against the passage, go looking for specific ideas, and if you have truly no idea what's going on, we can avoid those words altogether and place a smart bet by guessing an answer that does not include the trap words that we're used to. Quantifier words that start putting numbers to things, those are a big red flag that you need to notice right away and try to avoid. On the actual SAT, I highly recommend drawing out these pictures and putting the numbers on them so you can see it more easily. You also hopefully will see that these are two similar triangles. So we're going to use a proportion of basically comparing the big triangle to the small triangle. So we can do that with the long diagonal signs very easily, right? We have 24 over 6, and that is going to allow us to compare 18 over X, the missing side of the small triangle that corresponds to the 18. We can cross multiply and divide, or hopefully we can see that six to, uh, it goes into 24 four times. So we're looking to divide. 18 by 4 to get this other number uh, and that was going to be 4.5 so here we go choice a is 4.5 but that is the trap and why is that the trap because they didn't want the other side this is what we saw for CD but they want AD this is a very common move that they make in geometry questions where they ask for something different from what your natural process is going to have you solve for this is a mission accomplished trap right we get X equals and we feel like we've accomplished the question we've solved everything but there's something else to do this is easily avoided by instead of using X, just label things in your math the way that they're labeled on the picture. Now, it's very easy to fix this, right? Because if 18 is the full way and this is 4.5, we can easily get AD, the thing we truly want just by subtracting, and that's clearly 13.5. They will very likely do this. They do this on questions like this where there's different lines on a picture. They also sometimes ask for diameter, knowing that you're going to naturally solve for radius. So you might need to multiply your answer by two. Just read the question before you choose your answer. Make sure you're giving them exactly what they want and that you're not falling for these kinds of mission accomplished traps because it feels good when you get an X equals in a question that does not necessarily mean you're done with that question. We should be very nervous about every single percentage question on the SAT. They are very heavy on trap answers. We gotta be really careful. I highly recommend that you use the open formulas, but you can guess and check here and you can do it. And even if you do, you might make the mistake because when we have a percent change, especially a big percentages, we tend to mess things up. What many of you are gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, I can increase 50 by 1.5. That's uh, going to be 150%. And we will in fact get 75, but that is the trap because that is not what the question says. The question says we're gonna increase our answer or our quantity quantity N by 150%, meaning we're actually going to have 250% of our answer. And if we do 2.5 times 30, we also get 75, and that is the correct answer. So remember, when we are increasing by a percentage, it's 1 plus that percentage, right? Uh, 1 plus 1.5 or 100 plus 150, depending on how you want to think about it. This is a very common trap. This is the kind of thing that you can walk into very confidently within three seconds and not even notice that you were getting an answer wrong. So you've got to be very careful on percentage questions. They are very likely to do something like this because they know you're not paying enough attention to notice these kinds of traps. If you've watched any of my grammar videos, you've probably heard me say at some point that colons are not for lists. That is not a real rule. I don't know why everyone knows it. So choice A is very clearly a trap that the SAT has set up knowing that you know this fake rule. The actual rule for colons is that we need to have a complete sentence beforehand and then we have some flexibility after. So it's easy to show why choice A is wrong if you just know the real rule. In the 21st century, many common consumer products are composed of parts that are made of rare metals such as we put a period there? No, we can't. The sentence isn't over. We can hear that. The actual answer here is D. We just need to continue on with the list because we've already attached the list with the correct punctuation here that the normal comma is fine. We can sometimes use colons with lists, but that first part is non-negotiable. We need to have a sentence before that. Make sure you are comfortable with the real grammar rules, not these fake rules that you pick up along the way. The SAT knows that you know certain fake grammar rules and they're going to put you in situations where you might be tempted to use them. But if you know the real rules, it's very, very easy to avoid these traps.
The SAT absolutely loves to set you up with stories that involve fake y-intercepts. So you've got to be very, very careful. What they want here is for PU to pick choice D. This is very clearly a trap. We have a slope of 70. This looks like a y equals mx plus b situation. We have a rate of 70, so that seems really good. And it seems like we are starting at $120. So our starting point, our y-intercept, should be $120. But that does not make any sense here. That is not exactly what they're saying. Remember, first of all, a y-intercept needs to have an x-coordinate of 0. This is not what happens when you stay zero nights. This is what happens when you stay three nights. And we should just think of this as a plug points into equations situation, right? We have three as our value of x, and 120 is supposed to be our value of y. If we plug that in here, right, that would be 210 plus 120, way more than what we're supposed to get for that y value. Whereas if we actually just do the math, we will see that choice b is going to be 210 minus 90, which is 120. And that is the only choice that's going to have a viable answer here. That is it. Where did this negative 90 come from? I have no idea. I don't care. This is just a plug points into equations situation. And if we use that strategy in as many cases as possible, a lot of the traps that the SAT is setting won't even appear as traps to us. We won't even think of them. We'll not, we won't even be tempted by them because we'll have a much more solid way of answering the question. So be very, very careful. Just because something sounds like a starting point in a story does not actually make it a y-intercept. The x-coordinate needs to be zero. But you can avoid all of this just by plugging points into equations and testing the equations rather than thinking about them conceptually. Okay, guys, we have made it to the single most infuriating trap, the one that drives me absolutely insane no matter how many times my students get it wrong, and they continuously get it wrong because they don't follow the main strategy for grammar, which is we need to look at the answer choices, predict the rule, and then go to the passage and see what we're doing. In this case, the answer choices are very clearly verbs in different tenses, but it's more than that. These are words that can be classified as either singular or plural. So the first step when you notice that is to actually do the classification. So choice A, that is a plural verb, have exemplified, that is plural, exemplifies is singular, and we're exemplifying is plural. So just like that, I know the answer is going to be C, and I know that all these other answers are traps. They're going to try to make me find the wrong subject in this sentence. But this three versus one rule works on every single official question that has been released so far. It is August of 2024. It is possible that they break this rule at some point, but for now, this is still the process you're going to solve. If one of these is different, you at least have a really good shot at just guessing the right answer right away. Now, if we go to the sentence, we can go looking for a singular subject to match with this singular verb and verify that our little SAT trick here is still going to be based in solid grammar. And if we go in there, we will notice lots of plural things, right? We've got the two people's names, that seems plural. We have experiments, that seems plural. Centrifuges, that seems plural. But the actual subject here is each, something that we would never have noticed if we were just diving right into the sentence. It's each of the experiments. That is singular. We were talking about those experiments as individual experiments. That is singular, and that is proof that we need choice C. But if you have no idea what's going on, you can still avoid the traps on this just by doing that initial step of classifying the verbs here as singular or plural. If you can't classify them as singular or plural, then it's probably not this rule, so move on to something else. But we always need to be looking at the answer choices for every grammar question because that is the best way of avoiding all grammar traps. We look at the choice first, we get a sense of which rule they might be talking about, then we go to the passage so we've got that rule in mind, rather than just reading the passage and listening to what sounds good. That is a better. Uh, that is a definitely a way to fall into the traps. But this one in particular messes me up. It really gets me angry because it is so easy to avoid if you were just following the basic strategies of singular and plural verbs and just looking at those answer choices before you start solving. Well, I hope that was helpful. Honestly, just knowing that the traps exist on the SAT is the best way to avoid them. And if you spot some of these on your exam, then please come back to this video and leave a comment so that other people can be aware of what's going on. If you are struggling with other things on the SAT, I recommend that you check out my Common SAT Weaknesses playlist. It's got lots of great videos that help you diagnose certain problems and give you advice and recommendations to try to solve those particular issues and improve your scores. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy any of my videos, please like 
like them, please subscribe. It really is a great way to show support. If you want to show even more support, please become a channel member. Channel members have access to original questions that I have written. They're of the same quality as the ones you saw in this video, but they're even harder and more challenging. So it's a great way to get more practice on specific topics without wasting the College Board's official resources. You can just click the join button on any of my videos to become a channel member, and it really helps me out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them on the comment video part of this video. And if you are taking the SAT soon, best of luck. You're going to do great. Just watch out for those traps. Once again, I'm Mike Sattel. And remember, when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less. Sattel for more. Thanks for watching.